Welcome to the Lookouts training session, Hoarding, Keeping Clients Housed with Richard Marquez. My name is Sarah Kift and I am your host for today. That's me up there with my daughter Callie. And before we get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this training project. This is a housing first readiness project and the Lookout Society partnered with Douglas College to do a needs assessment with programs across Metro Vancouver in order to develop training that is relevant and timely. And this project is funded in part by the Government of Canada's Homelessness Partnering Strategy. So I'd like to introduce our instructor for today, Richard Marquez. Uh, Richard is a registered social worker with the BC College of Social Workers, holding a master's degree in clinical social work and a master's degree in public health, behavioral sciences, from the University of California at Berkeley. Richard spent five years working as a housing inspector in San Francisco's Department of Building Inspections Housing Division. He was the liaison to the city's Community Code Enforcement Task Force for SROs and to the city-sponsored Hoarding and Cluttering Task Force. In this role, Richard worked with over 400 SROs in San Francisco's most impoverished and distressed neighborhoods, Tenderloin, Chinatown and Mission Districts. And Richard currently manages nine residential buildings and SROs in Vancouver's downtown east side with the Lookout Emergency Aid Society. Welcome Richard, it's great to have you here with us this morning. Thank you, it's really great to be with you too, sir. I think the question that we've, we've outlined here is what does it look like? What does hoarding look like in terms of keeping clients housed? I think a probably a corollary question would be what does it tell us about that person, people, the community, that housing arrangement. Working in the downtown east side, which is I think very similar to many, many neighborhoods I worked with in the United States, particularly in San Francisco, of course, uh, you begin to see that there's striking parallels and trends and occurrences that are very similar in, in how they play out in people's lives. Even though I'm grounded in the downtown east side, it's really a social laboratory and there's a lot of lessons learned that can be applied to whatever areas people are working at now, whether that's in Abbotsford or whether it's in Surrey, whether it's working in single family occupancy hotels in the downtown east side, or working with clients that are living in single family dwellings um, in the metro region. There, I think there's a lot of lessons, techniques, intervention strategies that we can learn from that I think will give us hopefully some kind of enlightened understanding of how to intervene around hoarding and cluttering. When I, when I think of um, hoarding and cluttering, I really want to get to the root causes of what produces it. And I think that's really a, a way to begin um, that's, that's just and fair and, and, and I think analytical in terms of understanding what people are up against, which is why I refer to the quote by Dr. Dr. Rosen, Dr. Daniel Rosen, when he, when he says, there's a fear that we lose a piece of who we are. Having the object in hand bridges the distance. Um, we all have objects. We all have things we've created or accumulated over life, whether it's mementos from family or photos of children, um, uh, whether it's art projects we created or whether it's just sacred objects that we've held on to for many, many years. So in that sense, I want to acknowledge the kind of humanity of what is underneath the hoarding and cluttering and not lose sight of that. The Spanish novelist Antonio Muñoz Molina, uh, the writer says, how can I throw, quote, anything away when everything has its own story? And this is fundamentally about people's life story and the story of a community. Um, and I, I don't think we can lose sight of that. According to the city of Vancouver's own downtown plan, Vancouver's history and this preamble of the plan says that it can be traced to the places and people of the downtown east side. Uh, from the Coast Salish people to the old Granville town site to Chinatown and Powell Street, Japantown, the downtown east side, like many other adjoining communities in the metro region, are also rich in history, culture, and diversity. In the census 2006, the people of the downtown east side, in fact, had the lowest median income of all city residents in Vancouver. Uh, the plan goes on to say it's a reflection of the large proportion of residents on income assistance, pensions, and other forms of public assistance uh, carried over to people that are struggling with chronic disabilities and impoverishment 
uh, statuses as well. In fact, poverty plays a pretty significant role in the challenge that the community has in terms of its health status, its social well-being, and not to lose sight of people's resiliency as well. I think it's fundamentally important to an understanding. Yet, the other side of this, the flip side, is homelessness impacts the downtown east side and other regions as well, as we're noting, um, throughout Vancouver's greater areas. Um, whether that's Surrey, or whether it's Abbotsford or Maple Ridge, or whether it's, of course, the core of downtown, homelessness is, in fact, present still. With that comes stigma and discrimination. Uh, some of the characteristics of all that, of course, are also low literacy levels. People living, as I mentioned earlier, with chronic disabilities and concurrent disorders, mental health and addiction struggles. There's high levels of unemployment. Housing unaffordability, of course, impacts all residents in Vancouver and throughout the whole metro region, but yet in particular, the, uh, the downtown east side is, is pressured by high rents as well and displacement. Some people refer to this as gentrification, but it does have impacts overall on the psychological, social, and economic challenges of residents. We mustn't forget, too, that people don't have certain privileges that some of us may take for granted, like having access to an internet system, um, being able to be part of this entire project right now before us. People can't access that in a home screen in their own single room occupancy hotels or a shelter site or even in a social housing unit. They simply can't afford that. People also lack cell phones. They don't have access to the latest iPhone technology. Um, they don't have personal computers that are at their disposal. So that puts them at great disadvantage uh, to complete what we consider to be very basic daily living tasks and activities. I think the other side that I wanted to introduce here too is somewhat of a cultural critique, Sarah, and that's about um, popular adult entertainment. And now we were talking earlier about the role that mass culture has in shaping consciousness and people's experiences. And again, it goes back to stigma. It goes back to discrimination. So when we look at Hoarders, the TV show that, that's produced by the Arts and Entertainment Channel in the States, A&E, they generally portray clutterers as people that are pathologized, uh, that, are, that are disturbed, that are mentally ill, and, um, and then, frankly, they sensationalize the depiction in, the, in, the, in those TV programs, and they exploit that. They also depict most hoarders and clutterers as people that are predominantly middle class and socially privileged, privileged suburban homeowners, and, and that would mean that they would have access to vast resources uh, family and friends and support systems to assist them in their single room or in their single family home de hoarding effort. And it's very different in our experiences, and I'm sure the viewers also have different experiences with the kinds of client and resident populations they're serving. I think I would argue they don't have those vast resources available to them to engage in the decluttering and the de hoarding uh, effort. Some of the key points around hoarding and cluttering from a mental health perspective is I think the definition of compulsive hoarding. If we look at the clutter rating system here from one to nine, we can begin to see the evolution of how it evolves and the kinds of safety and dangerous unsanitary conditions um, it produces, not to mention high levels of combustibility here with materials that are amassed in these, in these slides. Um, it's serious business uh, for, for not just uh, the community itself, but also for, of course, the resident and neighbors and, and people that may be living in this housing arrangement next door and obviously within. So compulsive hoarding, the way, uh, at least uh, the definition that I'm, I'm, I'm going to use is, one, it's a challenge. And I think we have to look at it always from a strength-based perspective. And that's acknowledging people's resiliency, their life histories, why they've accumulated this, this, this level of possession. Um, and the disturbance that causes in their lives, in the community's life, and how, in fact, it can lead to being pathologized or medicalized. But it's really a challenge to discard material possessions that are clearly unaccompanied by living spaces that haven't been designed or built for that purpose. And, in fact, it prevents people from engaging in really healthy living um, activities where those spaces were designed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um we all struggle with finding enough storage, hey? And it becomes um, all the more difficult when you add other issues around hoarding and, and needing to keep more stuff. I mean, Vancouver especially is a hard place to find extra room for all the things that are important to us. 
Definitely. When I worked at Carnegie, I didn't work directly. I, I fed people and I cooked for them, but I definitely saw uh, the struggle um, just in in terms of managing one's possessions because, uh, especially in the winter time, you know, public spaces have rules around where you can leave your stuff, and it was always a struggle to balance people coming in out of the rain with their suitcases, and that could be their whole life in that suitcase, um, and then having to manage um, keeping the hallways clear and where they could store that and then issues around bed bugs and all that kind of stuff. So it's a very sensitive subject that's hard to deal with when you're working with people in relationship. Definitely. All right, let's hear more about compulsive hoarding. Well, I think picking up on the beat that you offered here, you know, certainly people's life history is in that suitcase. Um, particularly if they're homeless and or have limited income, they, they certainly are challenged by, by, by resources and not being able to store away, um, dare I say, their pain, their anguish, um, the sacredness of whatever documents they have or photographs from their childhood, um, other documents as well they may carry along. So certainly there's, there's a, these structural limitations on them. At the same time, I don't mean to downplay the, the significance of the kind of dangerous sanitation condition and a healthy condition this creates. I mean, it puts people at peril. It puts people's lives at peril. It could lead to, um, that the combustibles I mentioned can lead to a dangerous condition. It can lead to, to fire. It can lead to, to pest infestation, whether that's cockroaches or mice or mites or of bed bug uh, gatherings. I mean, all these things can play out in terms of a very unsanitary and healthy ways. Um, hoarding, in fact, is a signal post for a, a distress. One could argue it's a, it's a cry for help. It, it also creates impairments in people's daily functioning as a resident or a patient or a client. And yet at the same time, we shouldn't lose sight, uh, not just of the, the safety and the risk factors, and take that seriously in response to both fire and building and property use inspections. But we can't lose sight of the importance of a harm reduction approach in doing this work. And having that court of sympathy and compassion always weaving itself through as difficult as it can be, and I maybe probably will respond to that later on, to some of these challenges and how aggravating and, 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 and difficult they are in terms of having dialogues and planning interventions with residents and clients. But the public health approach nonetheless emphasizes strategies for addressing the unhealthy consequences of a risky and potentially harmful behavior, like hoarding and cluttering. Um, like you've mentioned earlier, Sarah, uh, people do actually hoard food because of their low-income status um, and limited nutritional resources within the community or beyond. They yeah, just they don't, don't have that. They don't even sometimes have access to a refrigerator, hey? Absolutely. Uh, uh, we sort of take that for granted that we have uh, ample space to store our food. Um, but for a lot of people living in SROs or places without those amenities, um, they have to either get enough fresh food for the day or rely solely on canned goods and dried food, which then can cause a risk if they're hanging around too long or the packages aren't closed properly. Definitely, and I think the harm reduction approach, you know, it's a mutual dialogue what we learn, and I certainly have learned so much from residents themselves, particularly in single room occupancy hotel. Uh, t uh, tenants in the United States and also here in the downtown east side and, and very flippantly in humorous ways they've told me that uh, their rooms, their single room occupancy places are so small that they have to go outside to change their mind. <laughs> so therefore they can't obviously store foodstuffs, they can't store a lot of belongings, if they do they're up to the ceiling, right? So sleeping room only is another uh, name for the acronym SRO, but definitely I think what we look at is a way of trying to mitigate and balance out this behavior in this disorder or this condition so people are safe and thriving in these spaces and looking at the continuum of housing beyond staying in a single room occupancy which generally is transitional housing. The other things that come into play too in this approach is an interdisciplinary medical approach or public health approach I should say to empower patients or residents or clients to better self-care which is also at the heart and soul of cluttering and hoarder. Again, as I mentioned, it's a cry for help. It's a sign of distress and impairment and functioning. And so certainly it's about self-care. It's about clarifying and coordinating on ongoing care for those residents uh, and shelter guests, um, looking at what support systems they have 
and part of their, their universe. Whether it's a tenant support worker, it's a case planner, it's a doctor, it's a nurse, it's an outreach worker. Um, what resource, what key people in their lives are part of the whole self-caring universe in terms of coordinating how to complete this ongoing care intervention? It's part, obviously, of a larger system of care in using those decision support tools that we have in our community to provide the kind of follow-up and tracking as part of the standards, procedures, and most inspection departments um, checklist. And again, not, not forgetting to mobilize whatever resources we have available to us um, to meet the needs of those clients, those residents, of those patients. Uh, it's also about culturally competent care, which is often forgotten. And the way I would define that, Sarah, is the ability of systems to provide care to patients or residents or guests that have diverse values and beliefs and behaviors, including designing and tailoring delivery systems to meet those patients' social, cultural, and linguistic needs. And being sensitive to people's um, challenges and orientations in life, whether they're First Nations or people that are LGBTQ, two-spirited, uh, youthful people, people that um, um, are recently released from institutions. I think it's about looking at culturally competent and a very broad set uh, of, of, of the lenses. At the same time, what, we've, what we found, at least I have, and most of the practice and literature that I've discovered in, 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 in my approaches to the work, it's about utilizing a CBT approach, which stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And that's something that we've forgotten about. In this day and age of uh, pharmacological responses, we've forgotten about talking with each other and talking to people, people listen, being listened to. And certainly with these stress calls, and uh, as the writer and earlier in, in the beginning, uh, Antonio Molina says that there's a story that people want to tell with the accumulation of their possessions. As dangerous and, uh, and sanitary as it is, there's still a story that they want to that they want to tell and that we need to listen to. And so with that, we have to look at what's underneath this unhealthy practice or condition of their suite or their room is moods and behaviors. And um, it's maladaptive behaviors. It's distorted thinking patterns. But it's about using whatever mental health providers and resources that we have to intervene um, when we see this, this signage of hoarding and cluttering happening in people's lives. So now, now I believe we want to move on to scenario one, a hoarder in denial. So in scenario one, we have a client who is a 55-year-old woman who was recently housed. We've heard her landlord has expressed concern over a smell emanating from her suite. And you've agreed to go and talk to her. Uh, when you arrive, she says that, that since it's a nice day, you should sit outside on the patio. She's very resistant to you coming inside. So we have a series of questions here. Um, what can you say to gain entry to the suite that will not damage your relationship with the client? And how can you prepare yourself ahead of entering to make sure that you control your reaction to what you might see inside? How can you approach a decluttering conversation with your client? Richard, did you want to talk a little bit about what you would do? Or? Definitely. Yeah. I think, uh, again, I mentioned if this had happened, let's say, within the city of Vancouver, uh, the first thing I would do just from a social work perspective, a public health harm reduction uh, response, would, would contact, I would contact the city of Vancouver. I would call you know, BC211 line and begin a conversation with them, a referral, and also just um, a consultation an ongoing collaboration with that task force and those professionals. Um, I think you begin to investigate as well um, if you're allowed entry into the suite uh, by this 55-year-old person. You, be, you, you want to ask questions around the nature of her tenancy there. And you should know right away some basic things. If it's a single room occupancy hotel, you'll know that right away. Um, if, if it's a social housing Suite. You want to know if a nonprofit housing society is managing that suite. That's really crucial information because that helps you develop your access of collaboration with the with the staff of the society and or with providers. So you're already starting to assess how to amass relationships with other providers and how to intervene. Um, if it's not, you want to find out if it's a private landlord. Is it a private 
property management firm is very distant from the, from the housing uh, residency itself. Um, they just merely collect rents and, and enforce uh, code habitability standards, or do they have a relationship with the residents that live in this building? So these are really key questions. You also, of course, if you're if you're uh, in, invited into the suite, there's some some basic client-centered, strength-based um, interventions that you want to think of immediately. And I think this goes back to the earlier part. I think you want to look at the person's resiliency capacity. You want to really affirm who they are as a person, what they've done with their lives, if they begin to open up to you in this beginning conversation. Um, I think you want to approach it obviously very non-judgmentally. And you want to develop a relationship, at least in terms of how you can, how can you assist, and how you can help in this decluttering and dehoarding effort. And that's assuming, of course, it's not high levels of denial, and and, and that person wanting to have this discussion with you. Um, I think it's a good sign, at least in the scenario, that she invited you into the suite. That may not always be the case, and we can certainly talk about that kind of denial and that resistance that may, that may play out. But she does say in this scenario, and maybe it's a sweet-sounding scenario, but she does say that um, it's a nice day. Would you like to sit down in her patio? So, of course, you certainly take her up on that offer, and then you begin to realize that once you're in the suite, there is resistance. So, again, I think you want to look at your own, your own kind of psychosocial cursory assessment of what you're seeing in, in the suite, who this person is. You want to look at um, you know, facial gestures, bodily movements. Um, you want to stay very open in your person and how you explain things. And you certainly don't want to use a fear-based approach. It sounds like it's the polar opposite of the A&E show, right? Bursting in with a camera for that massive shock value. Um, I like this question. How can you prepare yourself ahead of time? entering to make sure you control your reaction to what you see inside. It's sort of about just taking that deep breath and going, okay, I'm not going to be in space of judging or, or being shocked. Um, I'm just going to enter into this person's context and just be present with them. Um, it's like sort of what not to do would be the hoarder's show and what to do would be to just be gentle, open in your posture and some of the other things you were saying which were really helpful. Definitely. I think one other thing I can add too, and certainly change the, uh, the the kind of nature of this um, corollary scenario, but in some of the work that we that we do in the downtown east side, particularly in some of our social housing stuff, I, I do remember a situation where there was a resident, a female resident as well, who um, the levels of cluttering, uh, cluttering and, and, and hoarding were um, were just abundantly massive, to the point where there was no passageway where you could even enter the suite safely. So in case of a fire, there's egress is being blocked. These, of course, are classic housing inspection, property and use fire inspection terms of a checklist and how they do an inspection in terms of rating scales and, and also how penalties are assigned and what's called a notice of violation when that's issued. So right away, you know, signs in the world were, were certainly ringing, alarms, that were alarm bell, bells were ringing, and, and definitely the staff was just absolutely challenged, like, well, how do we even begin to tackle this? So as we begin to unfold in, in our intervention scenario or in, in a real life plan that we that we put together, we we were very fortunate to be part of a larger discussion with this woman's providers. Um, she had been working with uh, a doctor, a psychiatrist, had been working with an outreach worker, had previously been referred out to the cluttering and a hoarding task force with the city of Vancouver. But as we began to reveal her social history we began to see that she was living with a chronic debilitating condition and had lost many family within the last uh, several years. And so all these boxes that had accumulated in her suite were the remnants of her, of her daughter, of her daughter's um, apartment possessions. Her daughter passed away. So she brought, all those, she brought all those possessions into her suite. And it was, it was essentially loaded up with what she had before and now loaded up with the remnants and the mementos of her daughter's life. Mm -hmm. And so when she began to explain this both, both to the providers and, and tenant support workers in a, in a kind of clinical setting, then you began to understand the unraveling of her life and how, in fact, this was the story of her life, the loss of loved ones, and how being dispossessed of that was the greatest fear in her life. Aside from the impact it was having on the safety and sanitation in her suite, and the dangerous condition that causes, 
there was something more acute at play here, and that was just the emotions and the feelings. And I think that sparked in us a whole different way of acknowledging this and how to intervene. And certainly still challenged, but I think the approach was more, again, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, where we involved the doctor, the nurse, the outreach worker, and we began to see how there's ways that we could substantially reduce the amount of storage in our unit and possibly find safe, affordable places to transfer some of these prized and sacred um, mementos from our daughter's life into more safekeeping. Mm -hmm. But we approached that discussion in a very, very different way. So it was dealing with the person first and then the staff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. What their story is mm -hmm. and how they needed to tell that story. Yeah, that's a great example. I think the other part, of course, not to downplay the significance of, of the hoarding and cluttering from a, a public health and of a, of a sanitation um, perspective, I think we have to also remind people of the rights and responsibilities. So that comes into, what comes into play here is the Residential Tenancy Act. People have rights, residents, tenants have rights in terms of other responsibilities, but at the same time they have certain protections. So a landlord or an agent thereof cannot just barge in and say, I want all this out and you have until you have until midnight to do so. So those levels of intimidation and that level of intrusion and invasion and um, volatile responses are not really, they're not allowed legally. There has to be um, a period of time where you give people 48 hour notice, a 72 hour notice, depending on the rules of that society or that organization. But people need ample time legally to be allowed to enter their suite and have an inspection happening to happen. At the same time, I think it's important that if you're a landlord or the agent of a landlord, let's say hypothetically you're a tenant support worker and you enforce the RTA, the Residential Tenancy Act, then it's important to have uh, in this discussion the, the third party, and that's the tenant advocacy um, service or tenant advocate. So you make those referrals to whatever tenancy advocacy service exists in your city or your region, and you, you, you collaborate with them openly, uh, whether it's TRAC, the Tenant Resource uh, Advocacy Center, or whether it's the RTB, the Residential Tenancy Branch, you work with these organizations in a very uh, open, kind of collaborative way. I mean, the aim here is to declutter and dehoard in a compassionate and considerate and kind of a multidisciplinary way, if you can successfully do that. Not always the case. But I think what you want to do, again, is from a client-centered, strength-based perspective, you want to develop and design an intervention plan that explores the resources of stakeholders in the community that can help you successfully do that while supporting the resident in these hoarding and cluttering challenges. That's scenario one. Now I think we should move on to scenario two, clearing the path. I think here in, in scenario two, if I, can, if I can outline it briefly, uh, it, it spells um, the following challenge. And that a 62-year-old male is living in one of the rooms in your shelter. You've noticed a progression of him accumulating belongings in his, in his room. But it has not been a cleanliness problem, and yet there have been no signs of pet infestation or bad smells. His collections are mostly newspapers and magazines, which he neatly stacks in his room. He has been open to decluttering in the past, his main concern has been surrounding recycling materials and is feeling that, yeah, that your location doesn't have the necessary space to accommodate his recycling boxes. This time when you go in to inspect his suite, his room, you find that you are unable to enter easily. You need to walk sideways, in fact, to get in between the stacks of newspapers and other items on the floor. You can see above them and you notice that they are blocking his window. You know that each room has two sources of safe egress, of course, according to property use inspection and fire inspection guidelines and regulations, and they're blocking the egresses in terms of an easy access way to escape in case of fire or other dangers. Currently, he has blocked one of the windows and is in the process of blocking the other. That is the door, the second secondary means of egress. How do you approach this client to ensure his safety and work is effective in decluttering his room. Richard, do you have anything to say about that specifically? I do. I, I, again, I think you, you look from the scenario here and you pull from the strengths and some of the evidence I think bears out that there's some positive developments here. 
One is that you've noticed that there has been a progression, not just of the belongings, but one could say that there's been a progression in his willingness to at least talk with you about the, the cluttering in his, in his suite. You do notice that there's no pest infestation, which is already a good beginning, that there is some level of what some may appear to, to think it's disorganization, but there's kind of an, an organized um, process to his belongings. So it's not causing any kind of bad sense or smells or uh, odorous kind of condition, and there's no currently pest infestation. And you notice also that they're neatly stacked in his room. So again, it's pointing to order. There is some, there's some method to this madness, you could probably say. And that is that the collections are mainly newspapers and magazines. Um, I think I would begin by asking this person, I would ask him why he collects newspapers and magazines. What in particular uh, is intriguing to him about these newspapers and magazines? What type of magazines are they? And are they recycling? Is is he someone who's just accumulating knowledge and information and is, doesn't want to let go of things? So I think I would I would broach that 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 subject with what he's accumulating and talk to him about that. Um, let's say hypothetically, there's sports magazines. You may want to talk to him about what that favorite sport is and just kind of begin to ignite a discussion from where he's at, from his worldview. So that's the way I would approach it. Um, I think the scenario also denotes that he's been open previously to having a, declutter, a decluttering discussion in this past with you. So again, you've had a historic open door to have this conversation with him. Um, his main concern is recycling materials and is feeling that that the suite or the, the shelter site doesn't accommodate his recycling uh, needs. So again, it's about the conversation. It's about the dialogue. It's about the life story. And you, you have another opening here. So clearly, he's a recycler. He likes to recycle. So let's talk to him about that. And again, looking at our, 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 uh, our, our chronic care model, uh, looking at our um, harm reduction approach, Let's talk to him about what knowledge he may have of recycling agencies in the community. I would even dare at some point, if the, if the relationship can develop to that point in that, that discussion or in a series of discussions, about even volunteering to work with an organization that recycles, whether it's Yes We Can uh, or whether it's another environmental agency. Maybe there's a way of organizing a field trip with him and find out if he has other support systems, of course, social worker, a counselor, or an, an entrusted tenant support worker, a shelter resource worker, and look at his care plan that's on file, if he has any other relationships with key stakeholders or key people. Talk about exploring what recycling means and seeing a recycling center. I think that's something to look at in terms of helping him conceptualize a, re, a, re, a reorganizing of the decluttering and, and de-hoarding process in his mindset. Um, those things come to mind right away. They, they strike me immediate, immediately with, with impact. Um, of course, don't want to downplay the dangerous condition. He's blocking secondary and primary means of egress. So the window, um, in case of fire or in case of any other kind of peril, he can't escape. So again, I think you approach that discussion from really a life-affirming perspective. His life history, his value, his strengths in his life, um, and what that could mean to him. And, and I also would, would acknowledge the community that he is part of, uh, whether it's neighbors living next door to him, um, how fires can obviously travel next door and they impact the entire safety of a large bulk of people that live in that building. Uh, there may be elderly people that live in that building, people that have mobility impairments that are disabled, that they would not be able to escape in case of a fire. So not only does it put his life in danger, but the life in danger of other trusted friends and other neighbors too. So I would look at it from a communal perspective and the impacts there. And then I think, uh, of course, the safety and um, those dangerous impacts again on his life. I think you want to bring that back to his individuality. Um, and then I think it's a way, there's a way of informing and introducing the very sensitive yet yet very truthful way, the impact of it potentially leading to the end of his tenancy. And that's where you introduce the his rights and responsibilities and the Residential Tenancy Act and how these are violations of the act itself. And also that calls into play the role of inspectors 
fire and building use inspectors and building inspectors that can come to the site and actually issue notices of violation. And that can get very costly, very burdened, and very pressurized for him. And we certainly don't want to go that route. And I think you explain all the parallels involved and challenges and advantages and disadvantages if we can't work this thing through collectively with all the resources and providers. That's the way I would have at least attempt initially to approach this conversation in scenario two in terms of clearing the path. Mm-hmm. Well, those are all excellent and, and experienced responses. I know that our listeners are thinking through this, and this is just a practical uh, safety question that came up, and that is, short of a hazmat suit, what sort of clothing or shoes do you wear, Richard, when visiting a hoarder in their residence? Certainly, I think the suit is, 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 is definitely something you should, you should uh, no pun intended, suit up and put uh, careful um, materials on your feet as well. Uh, make sure that your, your areas, uh, both on your feet and your hands, are covered. I often have, in the past in, in particular, have used um, a, a mask as well in terms of breathing um, to, to block any scents and smells, and um, I think that's very important. I also think it's important to, um, to explain to the person why you're dressing this way and the concerns that you have as well. I think it's important to, to, to let them know your own concerns in your own life, that you're not certain of, of if there's bed bugs, you're not certain if there's roach infestations, um, but in terms of safety and health guidelines, this is something that you, that you, have, to, that you have to adhere to for your own protection and for his own protection as well. Yeah, it's a great question, and it's and again, it seems like you do a good job of this, but sort of balancing that uh, dignity and respect with what could be alarming, you know, coming in wearing a mask and a, and a suit, but that has worked well for you in the past, I assume. It has. I mean, this is always a challenge when a resident sees you walking in, and so you know, this is Ghostbusters too. <laughs> yeah. And you're you're dressed in a total hazmat suit. It, it certainly gives pause for alarm. But I think your safety and your health and all those considerations definitely should not be short-sighted. Mm-hmm. And they should be adhered to. And so we have the results of this poll. And it looks like quite a few of us struggle with the issue of um, people unwilling to work with staff. About 37% of us have a hard time with that particular issue around hoarding, as well as sanitation and safety issues. Those are the, the two big uh, winners in the poll. Um, well, winners is probably the wrong word. Um, so I'm sure we're going to address that, talking about how to work with the staff when that's a, a difficult thing to do, how to get people to work with you. Uh, did you want to address that right now, or do you want to move on to evictions? No, we, can, we certainly I think we should move on to evictions. I think it's actually part of the part and parcel of that, of that response. Okay, great. So if we look at the eviction process, um, again, it's very legalized. It's very, it's very much driven by both fire and building and property use inspection. Um, and these are historic codes around building safety, and also from a public health um, standpoint, it's also framed that way, but clearly legalistic. Um, when you look at an evic- when, when a resident looks at an eviction notice, I think you have to again look at the kind of stress it can cause, and the kind of resistance as well. But there is generally a, a very tree-pronged diagram process to how an eviction plays out. And that is that the hoarder is identified clearly um, by the fire use inspector, property use inspector and or the fire inspector. So the process is definitely identified right away, including the, the, the cluttering and hoarding task force has a diagram or approach that's multi-pronged. And definitely they're, they're identified, they're sweet, uh, the condition of their housing, um, who owns the housing, if it's a social housing building or if it's a single occupancy hotel that's privately owned or owned by society, or whether it's a, a single family dwelling, all these things are, are definitely captured in the assessment of the eviction process. Um, you begin to uh, engage in the decluttering attempts. Uh, if it's if it's the hoarder is unsuccessful or unwilling to, that brings into play uh, the role of penalties and potential legal reprisals, and it does put into play the, the end of someone's tenancy. An eviction notice could be could be issued. Uh, again, I think you begin to work with the hoarder and the clutter uh, from a multidisciplinary uh, public health harm reduction approach. Uh, you don't lose sight of that. 
no matter for some of our viewers, that may be frustrating. They may say, we tried that, it didn't work, so let's, let's move on and get legalistic about that. And we have to unfortunately move to jumping toward the addiction. Well, I say that I can appreciate that frustration, believe me, <laughs> on multiple levels. And I certainly have not always been uh, successful and effective in convincing a hoarder and clutter to uh, be amenable and to work with me voluntarily in the decluttering effort and to remediate the condition of their suite. Certainly, we've had to go the route, unfortunately, of ending tenancies. But I think the basis of ending that tenancy certainly is about their own safety, their own health, their own well-being, and the impact on the community. Uh, the, the public health risk at play here um, beyond just a typical nuisance situation. It's really putting people's lives in danger, again, reaffirming their lives. But again, I think what, what comes into play is exploring from a, a strength-based, client-centered intervention plan. That is, before you introduce the eviction notice, you talk to someone about the possibilities of relocation, of transfer, of exploring other affordable housing options, looking at whatever resources they have in their community and in their own personal lives. In, in the case, Sarah, that you talked about, your friend of uh, the family, that your father uh, was was had a historic relationship with you, played a very prominent role in your life, according to what you said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had a family engaged intervention there, if I can say that. Yeah, absolutely, it was. And so you looked at many different alternatives, I would imagine. Right? Yeah, we wanted to preserve that relationship, and so before um, we eventually got the, the city involved, we pursued a lot of other options and a lot of other resources. And it was frustrating, and it, it took our patience, for sure, because when you're sort of looking at a place actually, you know, full of perfectly organized stuff, but which in in a fire scenario would have been very dangerous. Um, it's hard not to feel that urgency and, and fear on behalf of your friend or your client. Um, so it takes that practice of patience and going back to resources or reintroducing things that you've suggested before that might take time to land to think about those options. Definitely, and I think you know with the the, the, the kind of um, the soul of the work that you did with that man. I, uh, I'm assuming he's a male, um, but. Even though many of our residents are not related to us in a family way, or they're not um, they're not part of our social history in terms of someone we grew up with, we should still give them that dignity that they're a person, that they may be someone's father or uncle or sister or mother or, 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 or aunt, and we should treat them with that dignity too, that they acknowledge who they are and what history of relationships they have. We would want them to be treated the same way that this friend of the family was too. So I would take that approach. Um, again, explore whatever whatever resources are available medically, um, psychologically, mental health resources. You leverage those interventions to your advantage before the, the hammer, so to, so to speak, hits the eviction notice. Explore what is possible, if it is at all possible, for a transitional relocation plan. Often that is an intermediate way of avoiding a full-scale eviction, which is very costly, by the way. Particularly if there's a response from an advocate, um, it can get very adversarial quickly. And it, it can also lead to an appeal. And it can lead to a Supreme Court action, actually. And I had history myself of responding to Supreme Court actions in hoarding and cluttering cases. So certainly it's costly, it's cumbersome, it's burdensome, it eats up an enormous amount of energy and time, and it has an impact not just on that person's life, but on the, on the life of your staff and other residents. So I, I would look at all those approaches before you throw that hammer down and just slam an eviction notice on and say that'll handle it. Frankly, an eviction notice in itself, most according to the regulations and rules, you have at least 30 days to respond to it and you can actually even petition for additional time to amass evidence. So that hearing doesn't happen in 30 days. That's a great point you bring up because someone actually had a question earlier about how it takes between two to five months to get a court hearing, um, if you can get one, and then comparing that to an emergency eviction. So it's helpful to know that when an eviction notice is served, you have some time. In San Francisco, um, the, the Mental Health Association uh, did something very groundbreaking, like other cities in fact have in, in the United States. They realized that a hoarding and cluttering task force that brings together inspectors, and a nurse, psychiatric nurse, and a social worker, and an outreach worker isn't necessarily enough. And so what they fomented 
was the development of a peer hoarding and cluttering educational project. And they actually had hoarders and clutters that lived in social housing or lived previously in single occupancy or just renters. They became part of a peer-based navigational system. So you actually had people that formerly cluttered and hoarded, and they would actually outreach to the hoarders and clutters themselves and explain their own life story. And they would be part of the process of intervention and dialoguing around convincing a hoarder and clutter to declutter and dehoard. And that's a different element that hasn't been previously introduced. It's very been generally professionalized. Mm -hmm. But now it's more of a peer-based model of intervention, which I think can really reap rewards for us as well. Well, that's brilliant because, I mean, I know even in my own life the effect of peer support and being able to be supported and connected to somebody who has gone through what I'm going through uh, is so effective um, as opposed to somebody in authority telling me what I should be doing. I'd love to hear you speak to this about maybe thinking through if you are dealing with a hoarder and you have another client or someone in the community that you know and have a good relationship with, is there is that a, appropriate to maybe build that relationship between the hoarder and the, the other person so that they can actually help you encourage that person to, to deal with what they're going through? I think you know, it, it would be appropriate if all the consent forms are certainly you know agreed upon and signed and permission is granted and that person wants to be part of the process and the, the client or the resident of the hoarder clutter him or herself acknowledges that I'd like to speak to someone of, of a peer-based nature and doing this work absolutely I think it's appropriate but again I think I think the way to go is to form a project that's peer-based in Vancouver and I think other cities as well um, most health authorities as you probably know whether it's Fraser Health or, or it's Vancouver Health um, many health authorities actually are now moving toward very peer-based intervention models uh, around healthcare um, whether it's HIV and people living with HIV, the peer-based uh, model has, has really done wonders in terms of adherence. Whether it's around mental health disorders, people living with major and major, major depression or ge generalized anxiety disorders, people living with traumatic events in their lives, um, the peer-based system in terms of counseling and support. It just there's ways of reaching someone that a professional can't necessarily always bridge. So that's something I would definitely think that we have to talk about creating in the regions of, of this area too. But getting back to the eviction process, if I can, again, it's um, repeated efforts, generally speaking. Um, you're going to have plenty of time uh, with the backlog of RTB hearings, both scheduled in person and on the phone. Seldomly have I gone through an RTB hearing that's not in person. It's usually over the telephone. But I think anyone that has a chronic disability and limitations in terms of their um, mobility issues and uh, other, other issues, whether it's hearing impairments or, or deficits of any kind, they actually can request a hearing in person at an RTB hearing before an adjudicator. So that can even cost more time and give you an additional month before that hearing happens. Um, having it over the telephone is a, a kind of an easier way of it, make it happen quicker, but there is there are times where the hearings happen in person. So again, and are there any costs associated with starting a file with the RTB, or is it there free? Are. No, yeah. it's not free at all. Certainly not to the property agent. Uh, the filing costs can be waived, in part for the for the client or the resident, given their their means or if they're on loan income, they can apply for certain waivers around fee costs and penalty costs. But even with accumulating a case in response, there's filing, there's photographic evidence that you have to amass. There is costs associated to the resident themselves, so really no one's scot free from 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 paying a certain price. But the landlord or the property manager certainly has to pay a filing fee upward to hundred dollars. Um, and you have to mass all the information and you have to fax it or take it there in person to the office in case things get lost. So there's a lot of staff time involved in accumulating the evidence package itself. And a lot of that onus is on the landlord, hey? Is it, is, yeah. it is on the landlord or the agent um, of a private landlord, absolutely a property management firm. And certainly the TSWs or the tenant support workers play a role in the coordinators and um, there's a lot of different hands in this pie in terms of bringing the, uh, the evidence package together. So if all fails, let's say that you're not able to succeed in convincing them to be part of a decluttering and hoarding um, process with you, 
and there's just absolute defiance, unfortunately, then that's when the property manager, uh, I'm going to assume after they've worked with the Vancouver Task Force on Hoarding and Cluttering, which does happen. It certainly has happened in our work. Um, there are there are some residents that refuse to be uh, referred to the City of Vancouver's Hoarding and Cluttering Task Force, which is already obviously a bad sign because they're not willing to collaborate or cooperate. And that does happen. Not as often as you would think, but it does happen. If that does play out that way, then you're, you'd have to bring in the fire inspector. And the fire inspector comes in and issues what is known in the field as a notice of violation. And that's around the blockage of egresses, both the windows and the door, and the dangerous condition of combustibles that have accumulated that could catch fire. Um, pestilence as well, of course, in the stations of rodents and of and the bed bugs and mites and um, the list of things goes on. The impact that it has on the community and putting the housing stock at risk, all those things are generally um, high priority for the fire department. And you don't have much time to turn that around, usually less than 30 days. Um, there are three inspections. And then the penalties begin and fines. And those are generally issued to the, to the owners and to the managers and the societies themselves. That cost can't be carried over, passed on to the resident themselves. If it gets to um, to a court level, those fines are, can be transferred over in the overall outcome of the hearings as well. So they'd be uh, they would be on the hook for those costs as well. Generally, of course, a property manager does have 30 days to ensure safety of the residents. So it's a larger communal obligation to all residents of the building. Again. If the property is, is still at risk, the suite has not been decluttered and dehoarded, there's no progress, the society or the property manager and the staff are held responsible. And, and even other residents themselves feel unsafe. They're, say, hypothetically next door to the hoarder and clutter, and they have, dare I say, a migration of pests or bed bugs or cockroaches, or they're feeling that I'm at risk. For, for fire damage. I'm, my life's at risk if, if you don't intervene. You have a responsibility beyond just that resident, but to the entire community itself. So that can conclude to the, the, the unfortunate um, scenario of eviction. And that's where it becomes litigious, and that's where it becomes um, very conclusive from in, in the legal arena, in evictions ordered by, the, uh, by both the branch um, and then if it's appealed, of course, it can go to the, the Supreme Court. But um, generally speaking, there is not often appeals that happen. So it's settled by an adjudicator at the residential tenancy branch level, and an order of possession is issued. And that's the beginning step. Really, I, mean, I should say the middle step. Once you have the order of possession, then you need the writ of possession. And that's a separate matter that is also costly to the property manager, to the society and you have to pay a fee to obtain a writ of possession, and that is to execute the eviction itself. So merely having an order and posting that on the door and informing the client of the order is not enough. But sir, we have a chance here, believe it or not. So you have the order of possession. This is a document that gives the landlord possession and the tenant's order to vacate the premises. It doesn't always play out that way. You have to legally have a writ of execution, which means you have to hire a bailiff company and a bailiff company can only execute an eviction. I cannot, a manager can't, a tenant support worker can't. It has to be a legal, bondable agency that carries out the eviction themselves. And unfortunately, I have been part of a few of these occurrences. You have an opportunity here to negotiate and, again, to intervene. From a harm reduction standpoint, from a client-centered perspective, from an interventionist plan, you can begin to re- align the conversation again, Sarah, with this person and say, look, if we go the route of a writ of possession and the execution thereof, it's going to be costly to us, but also to you. And there's nothing pretty about it. In fact, you will lose all your cherished possessions. They will be put out by this bailiff company, and you won't be able to retrieve them. And actually, the cost could be um, carried, the cost of the entire event of eviction, your possessions could be sold by the bailiff company and or an eviction um, agent to recapture some of the costs that the society spent. So you would lose everything potentially. 
we do have an obligation to store an illegal storage um, space, people's possessions for 60 days, 60 to 90 days, depending on ability to negotiate as well and also the, the, the legal regulations. But nonetheless, we do, we do have the obligation to store possessions in a storage space for 60 days. If someone does not respond to that, then we can dispose of them <clears throat> and or sell them those, those possessions as well. So I would have that conversation very carefully um, and approach it in such a way where let's find a middle ground here so we don't have to go that route. You don't have a lot of time. You don't want them necessarily to use it to delay the overall writ of execution of, of the eviction. But it is an opportunity to realign the conversation before that final eviction's called and bailiffs show up and they're uniformed and they possess legal firearms and they actually engage in a removal if they have to, both the resident and their, pre and, and, and their belongings. And so I think that's the last ditch effort that you have to try to negotiate a kind of peaceful and compassionate way of making this happen. So then you're telling the resident about this scenario and then you're offering what kind of solution as an alternative before the bailiffs show up? Like how much time would you have then to renegotiate with the landlord or help them organize their stuff? You don't have a lot of time, and I think that's what the arbitrators will tell you, the adjudicators and also the courts, that if you delayed, let's say, the eviction and gave someone an additional 30 days or two months, it's not wise. Because really what you're saying is it's not that serious. Mm. Their condition wasn't of an eminent hazardous nature to the point where you actually extended the time for an additional month or 60 days. You were pressing so hard from a public health standpoint to really effectuate this eviction, yet you negotiated more and more time. So I wouldn't probably say 30 days, but I would say a week to two weeks at minimum, depending on the conversation, the character of the dialogue and the willingness of this, of this resident to engage with you. And you look for transferable opportunities. You look for relocational opportunities. Um, it's not unusual for us at times to, um, it's not commonplace, but yet it's not unusual at times to transfer someone to a shelter suite if they're leaving a suite um, that's a social housing self-contained unit and start all over again, really is the conversation. We're gonna put you in your own suite in a shelter. And from there, we're gonna work on a plan to care plan your strengths and resources and try to find another fitting opportunity for you to be housed, whether that's through BC housing, whether that's through another society. But clearly, it's about transferring you and not reproducing your homelessness. But finding a place where you can safely land and plan your next transition. I think that's what you do with that week or that two-week period. That's how you intervene. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, there's a lot to think about with this subject, hey? Definitely. It plays out in so many ways. So now approaching the porting kind of do's and don'ts. Yeah, I think I've probably um, listed a few of them already in our, in our conversation. Uh, but again, I think recapturing and reappraising uh, the do's and don'ts. Um, yeah, I, I clearly, uh, I think what manifests itself from the beginnings is respect and dignity and affirming people's humanity, building on their resiliency. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the beginning of the downtown east side, uh, a disproportionate amount of hoarder and clutterers that are living in social housing or single room occupancy suites and or shelters and even renters. Um, they're, they're people that have limited incomes. So again, it's acknowledging um, socioeconomic considerations in their lives and the impact that has looking at mental health challenges and addictions, looking at levels of marginality and social isolation. So again, the pillar of that is grounded on a respectful and dignified approach to having these conversations around decluttering and dehoarding. So you don't lose sight of that, the holistic nature of who that person is. Um, you understand, again, that their possessions isn't junk, isn't garbage. You give it a value that it deserves in terms of the conversation with them and even discuss the, the, the importance of uh, the accumulation of knowledge if it's gathering newspapers from a, a bygone era or, or whether it's magazines uh, from a hobby trade. Um, 
inclination that someone may have, you often acknowledging that knowledge that they um, that they value. And um, you want to understand as, as well in terms of some of the dues that I certainly agree with that that they're they're attached, people are attached to these possessions. This is part of their life, frankly it defines some of their identity in certain respects. Um, so it's very it's very difficult for them to part with these losses. I think I mentioned in one of the one of the scenarios about a woman who lost her daughter. And we began to realize that all those boxes that were hoarded in the corners of her suite were in fact boxes that belonged to her daughter who, who was deceased who had passed away. And she couldn't part with them. It wasn't junk. It was actually real real artifacts that belonged to her loved daughter. Um, so those that's important to always keep that in the back of your mind. Um, again, you don't certainly don't overreact. You try to approach this as difficult and challenging as it is non judgmentally, and you acknowledge that uh, you're, you're, you're supportive and calming in how you have these discussions with them. Sometimes these discussions have to happen one, two, three, four, five different times with a whole array of providers and key people in their lives. And sometimes the discussion has to be rehashed over and over again. But this is something that I think we must at least have beginning to have a commitment to, depending, of course, on the level of hoarding and cluttering resistance that's there. You approach them with the facts rather than feelings or judgments. I definitely agree with that the factual basis is of the, in, the endangered condition of habitability that it's putting residents in, including their own lives. So these are, these are factual um, findings from the fire inspector. The fire inspector was going to remind them of the facts. The property use inspector will as well. Uh, they may not have what some inspectors could, could construe as my touchy-feely approach to this whole thing. They may come down with a hammer right away in terms of fines and penalties, but they're also going to say that this is it could cause the grave loss of life, their own life, and the impact on the community. So I think it's important you stay in that factual basis too that there are legal and public health consequences if this isn't remedied and if there's no intervention. Um, you continuously reassure them as well that you want to work collaboratively with whatever stakeholders they have in their lives. If they don't have any stakeholders and you want to work with them to explore, to find, to develop a support system around them through the entire progression of this decluttering effort. So you want to do that. You don't want to strip them, of course, of their dignity and their lack of involvement. I don't necessarily think you would say that they have control over it, but they're part and parcel of the process of decluttering and that there's, there's room to negotiate supports to make this happen. Um, goals and timelines, certainly the timelines are important because the clock is ticking around the eviction diagram tree that we talked about, all the different prongs associated with it. If worse comes to worse, it does lead to the end of a tenancy and the hearing. So there are timelines that we have to adhere to. And of course the impact, again, on health and safety on both staff and residents, neighbors next door. These things are real and they shouldn't be swept under the rug and openly discussed. Um, and then of course you look at the clutter imaging rating scale. I think that's important. You give folks a real visual about the evolution and the conditions as well um, and what it causes in terms of the impacts on their own lives, the impairments, the daily functioning abilities. Of course, going, going back to the secondary means and the primary means of egress, in case of a fire or a flood, you can't escape. Your life is at risk. For loss. So those are things that you certainly want to talk about. And again, the don'ts. Um, uh, before I get back into the don'ts, I think the final do, uh, the do's would be, again, the continual discussion around affordable housing resources in the community, uh, the supports available. You make referrals um, and you engage the client around medical health mental health and medical engagements with primary providers. There could be so much that's happening here that you're just not aware of, whether it's cognitive deficits, let's say it could be dementia, there could be um, cyclical mood swings that are happening that you're just not fully capable of engaging, nor do, you, nor do I expect uh, the, the tenant support worker, the provider, to be able to do that that works for a society. They don't have that training, they don't have the background, but we do have resources and professionals that can play that role if they're willing to allow that in their lives. So again, the harm reduction approach is significant here. 
And just before we move on to the don'ts, um, we have a really good question here about how approaching someone in conversation around their belongings when their belongings are actually their job. So what they do is they collect and then sell things. Um, so it's kind of like they consider that process of collecting things and then being able to sell them as part of their income and their living. Um, how does that change the conversation around hoarding for you? It does change the conversation and certainly my experience is with binners or people that sell the flea markets or the swap meets. Um, that actually, one could argue, it's an, it's an entrepreneurial drive and given limited income, um, and it is part of, one could say, they're the kind of self-created employment. So it is a discussion that has to be approached differently, certainly. But at the same time, you don't lose sight of the public health consequences, right, and the hazards related to their own well-being in the unit and the suite. And also, depending on what these material items are, they can also cause the collection of dust and mites and cockroaches and bed bugs because you're not sure where they're brought up and they may not be treated. And, and I, I would also probably argue that you may have the rationale that you're self-employed and that gives you the right to accumulate as much tools or equipment as you want. You don't. There are limitations in certain confines within a limited space that you can store. And I think that goes back to the cluttering image scaling too. I think also, again, um, if you're working, work with the organizations that exist and find a way from whatever revenue you're generating from the selling of those tools, those equipment, those supplies, those items, find a way to try to rent an affordable storage space in the community as the alternative site to store your belongings, but not where you live, if it puts you at risk for eviction and others as well for health consequences. That's the conversation I would try to have too with them. So it's this idea of leveraging um, their livelihood with the fact that they might not have a place to continue doing business from if they don't sort of reevaluate where they store that stuff, eh? They'll lose their business opportunity because yeah. of the impact that it has in terms of the, um, the hazardous condition and the, the, uh, the health related consequences, right? But at the same time, don't want to lose sight, of course, of, of, of the resiliency. I mean, the fact that they're, uh, most vendors that I know are some of the most hardworking people. Um, and they're carrying loads for, for, for miles and they're recycling it as well. So there's a, well, one could argue there's an environmental, a good faith gesture that they're involved with as well. But again, I think it's acknowledging their resiliency, their ability to work. And that's where, you, again, you leverage your um, your community resources. Contact WorkBC. Find out how you can develop an entrepreneurial self-employment project. What resources available to you? What tools? What su what supplies? Maybe there is a, a, a presentation or a plan that you can work with your work safe worker around trying to rent a space, a workshop to store your belongings and work out of. Explore all these resources that exist, that exist in the community, including training and employability opportunities too. So I guess we're at what not to do now, hey? Yes. So again, no fear-based approaches is what I would not do. Don't walk in there again, as much as we've talked about this, about laying down the hammer and the law and engaging someone out of a serial from the beginning. Eventually, if it doesn't work out in a way that's amenable to everyone, it, it's going to get adversarial. So I don't want to dance around that. But you certainly don't start off by saying, do you know your tenancy is at risk and that you could be evicted? Again, let's not lose sight of everything we've been discussing here. Again, it's, it's kind of an interdisciplinary vision, a method of looking at everyone's life. Everyone has a life story that wants to be heard and told. And sometimes it's not told through words, but through the accumulation of objects uh, and the possession of their life biography. So again, you want to approach it from that standpoint. You don't want to come in there with the hammer and saying, I'm calling the fire inspector, this is out of hand. Um, you want to begin from a resiliency-based capacity acknowledgement and a strength-based perspective. Um, that's what I would do. That's certainly, you don't want to come in there with the hammer. So I hope that that's left with the viewers as well as, as, as predominant. Um, you don't want to not avoid exploring resources in the community. Again, maybe redundant, but I'm going to reiterate that again. Um, you don't want to take the ineffectual way out. 
you want to see what's available to you. Again, in the, in the last scenario, if you have someone who's an entrepreneur, who, entrepreneurial, who is self-employed, um, talk to them about employ, employability options, training options. This is actually a great point to intervene. Let's say you're acknowledging in their suite they have a bunch of jewelry and um, crafts and items. Why not explore with them the possibility of taking a course at a community college or at a community center, whether it's the Carnegie Center or the Weston Community Center? Look and see what's available to them. The Downtown Women's Eastside Center, look to see what's available in Surrey and the adjoining regions. They have community centers, they have neighborhood houses, there's community colleges, there's many different programs and that even low-income people can apply for and qualify for. So look to see what provokes their intellectual, their artistic, and their social curiosities and see if you can move in that direction too with some of it. So thoughts and behaviors. Again, positive thinking, right? And, and that's probably a misnomer. Uh, that can mean so many things to people, but, but again, it's approaching it from a resiliency-based perspective, acknowledging their strengths, again, to reiterate. I, I would even talk to hoarders and clutterers around uh, a role that they can play around donating items. There's people that I, I remember one hoarder and clutterer that I had met with who actually was not physically disabled, but this person accumulated crutches and wheelchairs and had talked about how he eventually was going to donate them. But meanwhile, he's picking all these items up and then you begin to discuss his life story and you begin to realize that his mom was invalid. And so he had this kind of sentimental attachment to things from his childhood. He'd always get her tools and aids and so forth. Certainly had some mental health disorders and challenges, but when we, we began working with this person, we made referrals to mental health agencies and a series of some of these items were actually were, were able to be donated. So it, it, again, it played into a kind of good faith nature of why he was accumulating wheelchairs and crutches and things like that. So again, I would look for those opportunities, right? Even people in your community and your neighbors that live next door to you, look to see how you can donate items to them, whether it's um, blenders or uh, rice pots or whether it's tools of some sort. Everyone's going to need something. It doesn't have it necessarily. So sharing it, I think, is important. Um, organizing people to be part of swap meets, street markets, finding ways where they can transport those belongings there and actually sell them for, for a price. Those are ways that you want to think outside the box. I know there's a fantastic um, program in the downtown east side um, where they have the market on Sundays, and it's just a swap. Like the city provides tents, they close off the street, uh, they turn something around that was costing the city a lot um, in terms of ticketing and staff time and made it an actual community positive thing where people could come with their belongings, with their possessions and trade them and, and make it work for them. Absolutely, I've been part of that as well. And there's a lot of bartering and training that happens and, and people do share resources with each other. But at the same time, it gives people a sense of community because you're actually selling something mm -hmm. at, a, at, a, at a very affordable price that you could actually use or someone else can. So it gives you a sense of purpose and meaning to it. And it's well organized now, the market, in terms of the relationships they have with nonprofit societies, too. And most of those residents, as you know, actually live in single room occupancy hotels or social housing or are renters as well on low income with, with disabling conditions, too. So those are some of the thoughts and behaviors. Again, the, the other mentioning would be um, some of the successes I've had. I've worked with practicum students, uh, their certification programs, uh, volunteer agencies. Certainly, why, why, why not work with volunteer agencies? If the Hoarding and Cluttering Task Force has a whole backlog of cases, mental health providers can't respond so quickly or have a backlog as well. There's not a lot of talking therapy or CBT related um, sessions available. Then work with volunteers and practicum students at community colleges and volunteer agencies and see what role they can play as being part of a stakeholder in this decluttering. Um, de-hoarding effort. Um, you never know one of the client, one of the residents may actually take a liking to this young student and or older student and they could develop a different type of rapport that you did not expect. Of course with everyone's consent and participation but again broadening the scope of support and a stakeholder acknowledgement and providers I think is what's key in how to intervene in this successfully.
And actually, um, my husband is a librarian, and um, there's a lot of um, library school students who specialize in archiving and digitizing. And um, one of his colleagues actually worked with someone in the downtown east side um, to digitize their entire collection of poetry and newsletters as part of that student's um, training in archiving in the digital world. And so what they did is they sorted through um, huge stacks of magazines and places where this person had actually been published as a poet and they kept all of the material and they digitized that entire project and were able to get funding to gift that person with all of that material access in a catalog on a hard drive that they could view on a computer. Um, so there's a lot of interesting ways that you can actually work that out with volunteers and especially yeah, people whose job it is to, is to collect and archive things. They, they love doing that kind of stuff. Definitely, and I think we have the technology, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a question of extending those resources to some of the most vulnerable people in society, too, right? Mm -hmm. And acknowledging the worth of their live history, too, right? For it to be perpetually documented and safe kept. Absolutely. Uh, things to consider. So in scenario three, what you have is what's titled falling back into bad habits, right? And as you have a client with a history of hoarding who has been able to declutter their suite successfully, they have managed to keep their suite clear for almost four months, which is huge mm -hmm. in our work. But recently you've noticed that they are reacquiring possessions again, so thus re-hoarding has begun. How do you start the conversation with them about their hoarding? What steps are necessary at this point? Well, in many ways, probably not surprising to you, Sarah, but this is like the easiest scenario to intervene on in part. Yet at the same time, I don't mean to discount the challenge here, but there has been a history of progression. So they have acknowledged that they were cluttering and, and hoarding, and they actually managed to clear their suite for over a third of the year. I mean, that's huge, right? So I think you, what you want to do is you want to assess in a dialogue the beauty, the brilliance of that, what happened to convince them to do that? What did it take, the resiliency involved, and then not losing their housing, and, and possibly rearranging the organization of all their, of, of all their possessions in their, in, in their, in their suite? Um, how did they catalog things? What did they discard? What did they keep? What happened? And I think it also, at least for me, from a, from a social work, public health perspective, it also triggers uh, assessment questions, at least psychologically and socially, around functioning. Um, case in point, what happened after four months? Why did they re, re, return to their old ways, so to speak? What, what, what kicked in? So I think you want to acknowledge at least um, very carefully what, what happened to them. Was there a break? Was there a crisis? Was there a traumatic event that happened in their lives? Were they returned to rehoarding and recluttering? What failed them in terms of integration of services or of care if that played out? I think that's what's important. And then you go back again and you look at their their client assessment plan or their client care plan. And from a strength-based perspective, with their involvement, you want to acknowledge, was there a psychologist involved, a psychiatrist, a nurse, an outreach worker, a social worker? Um, was there a debilitating medical condition you weren't aware of um, and or a psychological uh, situation that reemerged in their lives that led to them rehoarding again? What happened? Was there a loss of a friend's life, let's say, um, who they're storing things for? I mean, let's not assume the unassumable, right? Let's assume that a lot of different things may have happened. They may be keeping things for people. Um, I know that's certainly very present sometimes in, in some of our housing stock, that people that have successfully housed themselves store things for other friends and family. So there's so many things that could have triggered that rehoarding situation, even though four months previous to that they were very successful, and you were in your approach, I'm assuming, of making sure that things were decluttered, mm -hmm. avoiding the eviction. So again, the resiliency part, you acknowledge the strengths of the work they did, they did do, and they actually avoided the ultimate termination of tenancy, right? It didn't happen, and I think you build from that position of strength, and that's where the, the rediscussion happens again. Yeah, again, it comes back to this idea of working with that person thinking about who they are and what their history is and um, how you can start 
there first before you sort of look at all the stuff that's going on. And we're going to carry on here with Richard and uh, another scenario. And this is titled the force cleanup scenario. So this is when, when uh, unfortunately you're unable to intervene successfully and you're not able to amass all the resources in the community. Stakeholders may want to be part of the discussion in terms of avoiding the tenancy termination, but yet the client or resident, him or herself, does not want to. And so the resistance is high and there's just no cooperation. Then you're in a position where, unfortunately, you're going to have to move toward a potential end of tenancy. So things, uh, those, those things to consider certainly are um, the safety concerns. So the safety concerns are what impacts, obviously, the, the well-being and the life of the resident himself, herself, and also the community where they're living. Um, and then, of course, there's this the weight of the fire inspection department, the building inspection, the property use inspection divisions. All that comes into play. Um, so you have to respond to that as a, as a responsible landlord or, or, or society. You certainly can't turn away from that that response. And the, the first thing you want to acknowledge certainly is uh, the kind of factual assessment. So through the checklist, you begin to denote that there's combustibles. And those combustibles can be, of course, typically they're paper, um, they're clothing, wood, and cardboard. And those are the classic materials that are combustible that can certainly ignite by fire, a match, anything can, 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 can lead to a wire, a wire that's loose, it touches on a piece of paper or a piece of wood, anything can happen, a mattress, anything that's that's um, overly accumulated in a dangerous condition and stored or, or loose, it can cause that. Those are, those are certainly uh, combustibles that you have to keep note of and track. And, and going on on the list, flammable materials that they may have accumulated also within the suite, that's gas tanks or gas ovens turned on, um, maybe it's inoperable or dysfunctional and, and you, you smell gas. Um, I've certainly, certainly been in that kind of situation, so you have to respond to either turning off the gas valve and working with that client to make sure that's done in a safe way and explain the reasons why this is being repaired and, and the dangers around the, uh, the combustibility of what, it can, of what it can induce. So again, it's clearing uh, cleaning fluids, propane, plastics. Um, it's not uncommon at times to find tenants that have um, Coleman stoves in their room or hot plates which is why generally hot plates are illegal in most single room occupancy hotel jurisdictions and most regulations prohibit the use of hot plates. I know certainly in Vancouver and certainly in San Francisco, hot plates were the source of a lot of fires and the loss of life and of the stock itself. So you want to look out for those types of um, flammable materials and those are certainly um, hazardous, of course. And then the eminent hazards, um, dichotomy is usually the papers on the stove plastics, wood materials, clothing, just things stored everywhere. On heaters, certainly clothing dried on heaters is something else. It's an eminent hazard that should be looked at. Again, um, using liquids or fluids, propane again I mentioned, um, resorting to that usage as well as obviously very eminently hazardous too. And of course damaged electrical wiring, people doing their own repairs, pulling things from the wall, um, all those things, dangling wires, are, are very much um, hazardous as well. And would you um, necessarily be doing this kind of an inspection or a check by yourself, or would you try to get somebody to come with you who might be uh, knowledgeable in these areas? Well, certainly, you know, you would do your own suite inspection with the staff itself. Generally, um, if, if, if staffing permits, you certainly would have a tenant support worker conducting that. Um, there is maybe a triad of, of information that's shared between a maintenance worker, a building attendant, and a tenant support worker. But usually the tenant support worker is the one that pro provides the notice of the inspection and conducts it, so generally at times tandem with another tenant support worker as well. So that's where the conversation begins, right? This is the posting and the monthly inspection that happens, so people are aware of that. And that's when you have the signs of distress and accumulation. And that's the beginning of it. Then, of course, you know, the most central thing is what we mentioned already, the restriction of egresses, right? So windows can't be opened. They're blocked by the accumulation of hoarded and cluttered materials. I mean, there's no air ventilation, let alone an escape hatch to climb out in case of a fire. 
Um, those are, are, are flood. All these are concerns that, that, that are perilous to someone's health and safety and to residents as well. The passageway, right? The passageway of entering and leaving. If it's blocked, there's tripping hazards. Um, you can fall. Um, anything can happen if you're elderly. Um, it can lead to hip injuries or all kinds of other different uh, occurrences in terms of accidents. Um, can lead someone to be immobile too. So you don't want to restrict those passages, those egresses as well. Um, and then fire protection systems, right? It's not unusual to find residents um, pulling down um, smoke alarms on ceilings. The wires are dangling or they're just completely removed or the batteries are removed. So those are fire protection systems that have to be insured or operating and are in place monthly. All those are key variables in your kind of cursory inspection assessment. And I think we should remind ourselves this is kind of a, not necessarily a professionalized inspection that's usually handled by, if it reaches that level of urgency, it's then referred over to the the task force, the fire, building, and property use is involved, right? And they do much more of a comprehensive uh, routine inspection of the suite, too, if they're called in. Not to mention we have timelines and deadlines to meet with them as well. So safety concerns uh, is a discussion that has to happen, too. What you want to do, too, is collaborate. Again, you want to collaborate ahead of time with fire inspectors before something like this happens, before there is a, a fire that's fueled by combustibles. So you want to you want to alert, again, in, in Vancouver, I would alert the task force and make a referral that this is a challenging resident that you have who's ordering and cluttering. And then you want to have that discussion with the property use inspector. You want to talk to them and maybe even ask them to conduct a, a, a property use inspection or a fire inspection. Now, some people may say that's double-edged. On the one hand, you're calling them in, and that could lead right away to an eviction. Not necessarily. I would say if it's gotten to the point where you have not been able to succeed in your harm reduction approach, in your client-centered approach, looking at the resiliency, you brought in all the stakeholders, all the mental health providers, if those exist, other support people in their lives, family, and you have not succeeded in decluttering and dehoring, then what you do is you work with the task force, and if you have to, you work with these different inspectors, and you have that conversation with them, and it becomes much more professionalized. And the urgency may have an imprint on that resident's mindset when they realize this is an fire inspector. And generally, they'll issue a notice of violation. They're not going to be able to walk away from the situation that's hazardous and not write up some, some violation. And then you'll incur, obviously, potential penalties and fines if you don't remedy this within 30 days or so. To, to the reinspection. So it's serious business when you have to um, collaborate with the inspectors, but also include the tenant in that discussion as well. Um, again, refer, refer and inform and collaborate with your tenancy advocacy services. Let them know they have rights, but yet responsibilities under the Residential Tenancy Act. Um, work with that advocate. Let the advocate know this is an open collaborative dialogue you do not want to terminate the tenancy. You don't want to end it necessarily, but this is the risk, and these are the challenges you're facing and the impacts on the person's well-being and safety and on that community. So you have that dialogue. You can even present some preliminary photographic evidence to that, that advocate. They may not be have the time to come to the site and see the suite themselves. But if you generally, my experience is if you share the information, you come from a compassionate, caring, and a client-centered perspective, and you mentioned the unaffordability of housing in this in this region, and that you're working to find some solution so they're not homeless. They'll work with you as well and play a very unique and prominent role in trying to negotiate to solve this before an end of tenancy termination notice is, is given to a tenant. So work again with the advocates up to the point that you can. Um, and, of course, follow all the legal guidelines, all the legal steps, the rules, regulations. You don't want to enter at midnight. You don't want to be forceful. You know, it's illegal to do that. You want to give ample notice, legal notice and time to conduct an inspection. And how you do that is important. Um, you may have to, uh, certainly you have to document it in terms of a, of a report itself for each suite. So there's a condition. Uh, condition inspection report that you would complete. And most societies have that. Most agencies have that. Private landlords have uh, a move-in 
inspection or a move out inspection, but also there's annual inspection reports, there's monthly inspection forms that we use as well. So use those and document everything as well in the case plan. Sometimes you'll have to document as well document evidence if there's resistance and you suspect that the hoarding levels are so high that you need to start already amassing uh, legal evidence in case you have to file an RTP petition to end that person's tenancy. So you want to begin that process as well if it's at that point. You know, it sounds like, I mean, this is something that we all need to remember, but is this sort of balancing your professionalism with your feelings, hey? Yeah. You know, um, there's a lot of work that can be done in advance of an inspection or talking to a resident. Um, just sort of preparing yourself mentally, knowing all the rules, making sure that you have appropriate materials for documentation, and just refreshing your own knowledge um, so that you can come to that conversation or that inspection with being very well prepared, hey? Definitely. Uh, I think, you know, again, it's just, it ends with patience and empathy. Um, one could argue that, you know, this exhausts itself to a certain degree. And certainly, I can sh I share those frustrations at times. But I think it's important to remind yourself and have that internal monologue that it's about approaching it from a strength-based harm reduction perspective throughout the entire process. Uh, to collaborate with providers, collaborate with the resident, the client, the patient, seek those supports from the community, nonprofit agencies, governmental agencies, find how you can troubleshoot this way through the hoarding and cluttering challenge without necessarily it leading to the end of someone's tenancy. I will leave you with that. Well, thank you, Richard, for a great and informative presentation, and one with a lot of empathy and uh, heart-centered knowledge.